So given what we've seen, uh, you know, with the police and uh, especially in these university sieges, which have mm -hmm. been kind of the newest uh, version of the escalation of this uh, uh, protests and, and the, you know, police violence and so forth, um, how does that reflect on, I guess, the special status in Hong Kong? Where do you see, where do you see this going? Well, I think the special status is over. I hope not, but I think it is over. I think that reconstructing what we had before is Im impossible. Um, I think the police have been compromised gravely. Uh, the legal system is now under attack. They still have independent judiciary. But I think the most important thing is this. There's been a lot of fighting, there's been a lot of violence. It may be that the communists are gonna be able to use some kind of force to suppress the people for a while. But this five or six months has essentially made, taught everybody in Hong Kong that the Chinese communists are dangerous, odious, uh, and absolutely not to be trusted. So where previously a lot of Hong Kong people were sort of sympathetic or they were happy with the way things were, now you've got 7.5 million people, the population of Hong Kong, for whom Hong Kong is home, who, as we say in American, hate the guts. They hate the guts of the Chinese communists. And they're gonna go on hating the guts of the Chinese communists for the rest of their lives. Because once you kill people, once you carry out the kinds of atrocities that they have carried out, um, you don't, they're not forgotten. There was a picture of a fellow who had gotten out of the Polytechnic, very gaunt face, blood running down it. And I thought to myself, this guy is maybe 20 years old. To the day that he dies, he will remember this as absolutely formative. And what, is, what has been formed? A, an inextinguishable hatred for the Chinese Communist Party. So this was, from the Communist point of view, is very stupid. They should have compromised, they should have talked on day one. But what Peking or Beijing has tried to do is to operate by remote control. And they completely miscalculated. So the result is that they have created a stable population whose opinions are unlikely to change that despises them and distrusts them. Arthur, you know, speaking of rule of law, um, the, I guess the top court in Hong Kong recently you know, struck down this anti-mask yes. law, but it seems like uh, you know, Beijing is trying to interfere in that as well. Well, this has always been an argument is Hong Kong going to have its own court of final appeal or not? And in other words, are they going to have a Supreme Court in Hong Kong beyond which you cannot go? And it was agreed that in some cases, issues might have to go to Beijing, to the National People's Congress, which is an entirely unelected body of uh, basically hand puppets. And well, it, it's a political body. It's, it's not a, a political body. body. It has not, but but it's, it, not only is that, it's not a judicial body. But now they're saying that maybe uh, Beijing is going to have to reverse the decision of the Hong Kong courts. And of course, this puts in jeopardy the rule of law in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong people, since early in the British colonial period, when there were a number of cases that greatly impressed the Chinese with the justice in which they, with which they were resolved, uh, the Chinese people in Hong Kong genuinely support the rule of law. You can't say this is some crazy Western idea or something. They genuinely support it. So to attack it will be to undermine one of the last uh, sort of legs of legitimacy on which the government stands. There's a professor in Hong Kong, in uh, China, who said what this shows is that they still have independent, uh, uh, judicial independence in Hong Kong. I don't know where he is now, but this did not make him friends. But the Chinese people, they know this. The Chinese people are not, they understand exactly what's going on. Not all of them, 
but the ones who are informed, they know. Arthur, what is the significance of the fact that uh, basically U.S. Congress, you know, I guess the House by voice vote and then unanimously in the Senate has passed this Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, essentially saying the American people are behind the people of Hong Kong, right? I mean, that, that, that's how I read it. But what is the significance for the, for the people of Hong Kong? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt their economy and it's going to hurt their standard of living. Because what China would like would be to run the place without any freedom, yet have special treatment for the United States, from the United States, which is not extended to the rest of China. But if they extend their system to the rest of China, I think we have no choice but to be consistent and deal with Hong Kong just the way we would deal with uh, Guangdong or something. Uh, this is just, the, this is a situation that they have created themselves. If, if the communists had simply done what they promised they were going to do, none of this would have happened. What about for the protesters themselves, knowing that uh, the U.S. Uh, Congress has passed these bills? Well, I think this gives them a tremendous sense of international validation and one of the things, it's very, very important. Um, we've gotten so um, sort of bedazzled by economics that we've forgotten about things like democracy, freedom and human rights and uh, what we're seeing now is a rediscovery of our own history of human rights and the people who are teaching us are the victims in other countries who say, come on America, you know, live up to what you say. And of all, China, I would say, is the worst rights abuser of any major country in the world today.